we run down a comprehensive list of early House budget proposals. We follow Governor Bev Perdue's veto of two pieces of legislation, and we also learn more about a new testing standard that could come to North Carolina. Next. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Hello again, I'm Kelly McCullen. Thanks for watching. I hope this week you're ready to discuss some early budget recommendations because of the subcommittees charged with offering those recommendations to the large House Appropriations Committee released preliminary reports this week. The focus across this still forming House budget bill is on cuts and efficiencies. If you're following the spending, roll up your sleeves with me. We're going to talk for a while. The Education Subcommittee's early recommendations are calling for 8.8 percent cuts to public K-12 through education, 10 percent cuts to the community college system, and 15 percent cuts to the university system. Those cuts in total could run 1.25 billion dollars. Let's look at K through 12 education first. All teaching jobs, teachers jobs are funded, but only teaching assistant jobs for kindergarten and first grade are funded with state money as it's recommended. Local administrators and school support personnel, you would face some reductions. If you're in the community college system, it will begin charging $10 per credit hour next fiscal year and absorb $110 million in cuts. Expected enrollment growth would be fully funded, however. All state funding of community college athletics would come to an end if these budget recommendations hold. The university system would face cuts topping $400 million. The system would be allowed to cut most of the spending where its leaders see fit with a few exceptions. The Education Subcommittee recommends ending UNC Hospital's $44 million annual subsidy and specifies that UNC-TV lose its guaranteed state budget funding beginning as early as 2012. Lawmakers would have to specifically include UNC-TV in future budgets. This show airs on the UNC-TV network. It currently receives 45 percent of its budget through state appropriation. The ECU Dental School and University Building Reserves would get a boost under the Education Subcommittee recommendations. Shifting gears to early recommendations for health and human services funding reveals that its subcommittee recommends many smaller percentage cuts across a wide spectrum to meet a spending goal of $4.4 billion. 250 vacant HHS jobs would be eliminated. Smart Start would see a 25% cut, as would community health grants. Medicaid provider assessments would be adjusted. That would save $60 million. You would see pharmacy service changes and adjustments to provider rates that would cut collectively an additional $66 million. Inflationary budget increases would be stopped next fiscal year. That would save another $62 million. No state money would be given to Planned Parenthood organizations, and the state's abortion fund would be completely eliminated. Subcommittee chair members say the budget cuts will be coupled with some reforms that could free up HHS agencies from bureaucratic constraints to do the job as they see fit. The House Appropriations Subcommittee on General Government recommends 16 percent cuts across the various offices under its watch. The General Assembly is cutting open and frozen jobs and travel for staff members. The General Assembly would not be purchasing any new furniture next budget year. Over in the governor's office, Governor Purdue's team could lose 12 jobs, six of which we understand are filled. The lieutenant governor would lose his expense allowance of $11,500, but that would begin in the year 2013. The lieutenant governor's office would also see six jobs cut. The Subcommittee on General Government is proposing reducing state support for local libraries by 15 percent. State historic sites would see funding reductions. The State Archaeology Lab would be closed. The Lost Colony and the Shakespeare Festival would each lose its $219,000 state subsidy. Under Justice and Public Safety, the Subcommittee 
offering its spending vision has a target of $2.2 billion. Subcommittee members estimate that 195 workers will voluntarily leave their jobs, saving $13 million. Drug treatment court and family court would be defunded. District attorney support staff would be reduced by 117 employee positions, could save $4 million. 839 justice and public safety jobs would be eliminated in total, along with $95 million in total cuts. The subcommittee recommending spending for natural and economic resources proposes a 25% cut system-wide. The State Department of Agriculture would actually see a net funding increase, but it would be required to eliminate vacant positions, increase fees, and find other efficiencies. The House subcommittee recommends restoring $2.4 million to the state fairgrounds that had been redirected in the past. That's how the department gets its net increase in funding. The Department of Labor would receive about out $1 million in cuts, primarily by shifting five full-time employees off state funding and cutting information technology. The subcommittee recommends that the Department of Environment and Natural Resources receive $22 million in total cuts. Its forestry division would lose 20 filled positions, see a $1 million cut to its operating budget, close two educational state forests, and close other educational state forests an additional 10 weeks every year. The Oyster Sanctuary Program would be cut $1.2 million, leaving it with $200,000. Shellfish Rehabilitation and machine, uh, Marine Fishery Programs face funding reductions. The Environmental Health Division would lose five programs, including tick control and the private well program. Positions would be eliminated or transferred to other agencies throughout the division. Certain areas of DENA are given budget increases. The Drinking Water Revolving Fund and Clean Water Trust Fund each receive $7 million. The state zoo and parks get a small operating boost. The subcommittee recommends for now that the Employment Security Commission be merged with the Department of Commerce. Jobs would be cut. Trade show attendance would would be reduced. The State Division of Tourism would see its advertising budget reduced $1 million. The subcommittee recommends budget increases for the One North Carolina Fund, totaling $10 million. The Job Maintenance and Capital Development Fund would receive a one-time $6 million boost. The subcommittee recommending budget plans for state transportation funding cuts $4 million from general administration and slashes 75 jobs by December 2011. $35 million would be removed from secondary road construction and redirected for more flexible use. $50 million in road maintenance funding would be redirected toward resurfacing contracts and general transportation maintenance. State aid for local transit maintenance would be slashed $3.8 million. Inspection audit programs would be restructured. Driver's license field office jobs, they would be preserved, but other vacant positions would be eliminated. Driver's ed classes could charge $75 tuition. 53 highway patrol positions would be cut, but there are 85 vacant positions as of this month. Increased privatization of highway trust fund operations would occur. These budget options are recommendations only at this point. The House and Senate budget writers must agree on a single common budget bill and pass it before sending it to Governor Purdue. Governor Bev Perdue vetoed two bills this week, including legislation that would reform the state health plan. The governor calls the proposal to make state employees pay a monthly health insurance premium a tax on teachers and that teachers groups and retirees were not invited to earlier bill discussions. The GOP says the governor proposed health insurance premiums in her 2011 budget plan. She vetoed it because a lobbyist said we didn't get a chance to say something. Now, beside the fact that that's not totally true, that's the reason she vetoed this bill, is because she will do whatever that lobbyist or that organization tells her to do. So I applaud the governor for uh, perhaps surprising many of us in vetoing this, but I applaud her for at least being open-minded enough to listen to other people who had concern uh, after those people weren't heard uh, in either of these chambers. Governor Purdue also vetoed the bill allowing community colleges to opt out of a federal loan program. The House and Senate moved quickly this week in hopes of preserving soon to expire unemployment benefits. Their benefits extension bill carries a provision. It would fund state government until June 30th, 2012 if no new budget deal can be reached by June 30th, 2011. 
The continuing opera resolution would operate state government at 13 percent less funding, a level that makes many Republicans quite comfortable. The governor does not like the linkage. She says linking such budget terms to an unemployment benefits bill is, quote, extortion. We don't want to uh, be facing a similar situation to what we're seeing in, in Washington, where uh, you've got, um, at least in our case, uh, state employees and teachers worried about whether or not they're going to receive their paychecks. Uh, uh, citizens worried about whether or not the highway patrol is, uh, is going to be uh, patrolling the highways or whether or not the prison guards are, uh, uh, are going to be on duty at the state prisons. Employment Security Commission Chairperson Lynn Holmes wrote a letter to legislative leaders saying 37,000 North Carolinians are at risk of losing unemployment benefits. The legislature is meeting this weekend. Pick up your Sunday newspaper, see what happened, whether that bill goes through and gets signed or gets vetoed. The House and Senate will negotiate a final bill that would lift the cap on North Carolina charter schools. 50 charter schools would be allowed to open each school year. New charter schools would supply school lunches and transportation options to children needing the service. Local school boards could establish their own charter schools and a new state charter school commission would oversee charter school performance. Democrats have hinted around the governor could veto this bill as well. We'll see what the final Republican bill looks like later. Josh Ellis with the North Carolina News Network was reporting on this charter school bill all throughout the process. The big picture is what for public education in North Carolina if this charter school bill gets implemented. Uh, well, the, the thing would certainly significantly increase the amount of charter schools and the amount of students that could attend charter schools by not only raising the cap of 50 additional charters per year, but also increasing enrollment growth at existing charters. Um, they've kind of backed off some of the language that was talk about maybe creating an independent commission that would maybe not be exactly outside of the State Board of Ele uh, Education, but for all practical purposes would have a, a, a trump card over the there's still this independent commission would have a lot of say in, in terms of policy um, and would be able to challenge what the Board of Education does, but it's not quite as uh, strong as previous bills. And, and really, the, the other big change they've included is some language to include uh, transportation and free and reduced lunch for students that are, for low income students. Uh, this is something that doesn't currently exist in. Um, doesn't quite go as far as a lot of some of the Democrats would like to see, but still uh, does address those issues. So a charter school, the, going back to the state commission, would be like a state board of education light, but it would cover charter schools. That... It would be uh, an agency that would make recommendations, okay. and, and the, the board would ultimately have to approve them. Uh, but if they denied something or, or shot something down, they'd have to give a reason why they were doing it. And they could also, any kind of ruling or decision they can make would be subject to judicial re review. Excuse me. Now, this is a Republican bill, no doubt about it. How much did they give back to the Democrats in hoping that they could earn some bipartisan support for this bill? Well, by I think by not um, making it just unlimited number of new charters, that's certainly a concession. Simple, the fact that they've added this transportation and the free and reduced language is something that's not even including in uh, the existing charter. So that means that there's a certain measure of bus transportation right. to bring so the kids and feed them lunch miles. at school. And yeah, and the thinking was if you don't provide those options, you're really excluding the students that could attend these charter schools. Um, you know, a lot of charters don't have to provide transportation. So, you know, if, if parents can't get those kids to school, uh, without a, you know, a bus there, then that certainly would knock out who could potentially attend there. Um, the one thing that they haven't really gone as far as Democrats would like to see them is also in terms of these virtual schools. There's um, some talk that by how these uh, schools are set up that you could see you know, this pop-up of, of new online schools and a lot of homeschooling parents. Republicans say this is really an over-exaggerated criticism, but it's certainly a... It moves more towards what Democrats have liked to see away from the version we saw out of the Senate, but not far enough to get Democratic votes. Josh, Except for, excuse me, one Representative Brandon right. from, uh, from Guilford County. And I jumped the gun, but thank you for being on the show, Josh. Hope to have you on real soon. Thank you. The House approves new incentives for electric vehicle usage. Electric vehicle owners could use HOV lanes when driving alone and be exempt from annual emissions testing. Representative David Lewis was running this bill, as they say. He says an original incentives idea was more ambitious, but simply too expensive right now. It was discussed that perhaps we could offer some sort of a tax incentive or tax credit towards their purchase. And after working with the proponents of the bill, 
and recognizing the uh, fiscal constraints that our state faces, we said we just can't do that, but maybe there are some other incentives that won't cost uh, money that we can in fact uh, do. Qualifying electric vehicles must be street legal, must be able to reach 65 miles per hour, and require an external electricity source to be plugged into and recharged. A House bill would essentially invite companies to explore for energy throughout North Carolina. A new state commission would issue the invitations to large-scale fossil fuel and green energy companies. Senate and House leaders and the governor's office would select the commission members. Senate legislation could reform the state's corporal punishment rules. The proposal would require parents to opt in if they want their child spanked as a classroom punishment option. Parents must sign a permission slip. So this would make it a little bit harder on, um, on the administrators to uh, administer corporal punishment, and it might be something that is past its time, and there are other ways that uh, people could uh, innovate and and um, rectify a situation. Now, kids would take the permission slip home if it is not returned or not returned signed. The school couldn't paddle the kid who takes the permission slip home. Lawmakers approve allowing North Carolina's General Assembly police officers greater authority when working away from the legislature. These officers can already travel with lawmakers and staff on official business, but this bill and law would let them secure an area and conduct threat assessments before a legislative event takes place. The General Assembly police would also be given power to deliver subpoenas. A House bill called Laura's Law would increase prison time for drunk drivers whose case involves multiple factors. For instance, the drunk driver could not have a previous DWI conviction within the past seven years, be caught drunk driving with a child under 16 years old in the vehicle, or cause a crash that injures people. If three provisions can be proven, they're called aggravating factors, in one case, the drunk driver could receive three years in prison with no parole, face fines up to $10,000. The Senate has passed House legislation that would create murder charges against people who target a pregnant woman's unborn child. Murder charges would apply to purposely killing a fetus, even if the mother survives. Manslaughter, assault, and battery charges could also be applied in an attack. Opponents say Ethan's law would apply to attackers who may not know their victim is pregnant. The bill will provide a deterrent against violence, including domestic violence that is directed toward pregnant women and the children they are carrying, and it will provide a mechanism by which justice can be provided to the mothers of unborn children and their families who are left to pick up the pieces after an act of violence against them. What I have a problem with this is that there's no knowledge required in this. The person doesn't have to know. The pregnant woman doesn't have to know. And I feel that that is a, a violation of a principle of law. Ethan's law would take effect December 1st, 2011. The full house has approved a new proposal for assessing, preparing, and testing middle school and high school students for national academic tests. Supporters say it will give teachers freedom to teach, something they say the soon ending state standardized test did not allow. The North Carolina General Assembly overwhelmingly voted earlier this legislative session to end state-produced standardized tests for high school students. A new bill, House Bill 766, would create new assessments for elementary students and ending with all North Carolina high school students taking at least the ACT. The other tests were based on subject matter. You've got a test with U.S. history or a test with civics. This is just a test that will test all students. It's a broad stroke and it really addresses our uh, problem that we're having with kids that need to be remediated. The State Board of Education would work with education boards of 42 other states to track student academic growth on a multi-state, not necessarily a multi-county basis, as was tracked under state subsidized tests. It just makes it widespread and it makes uh, our, you know, more it's a universal, I guess it's better accepted nationwide than what it would be when you just have it in our state, but uh, the same concept. 
This new public school testing bill appears to be supported by the education community and on a bipartisan basis in the House. Supporters say national scale testing is a more effective replacement for the concluding state testing process that some argued must exist so North Carolina can constitutionally guarantee all state students have a sound and basic education. I know that we hear a lot of concerns sometimes from teachers in the classroom and from parents that um, we, we waste too much time teaching to the test, valuable classroom time. And my experience with this type of testing is that it doesn't lend itself to teaching the test. The new national testing standards would take effect for the 2011-2012 school year. Mecklenburg County Representative Tricia Cotham is here with us to discuss a national school testing bill. Tell us about it first of all. You say it starts in the eighth grade. It does. The goal of this bill is to assess our students in a fair and reasonable manner. A few weeks ago, as you reported, we got rid of the four state tests at the high school level. It's a bipartisan bill that Representative Holloway and I have brought forward to really change the way North Carolina assesses our students. Currently, what we were doing is we were only using the end of grade test or the end of course test. So a standardized test. This is the opposite. This is more of a formative way to assess students. And the difference is in a formative test, such as the ACT is what we are recommending, is you can change the way you are doing instruction. So to meet the needs of your students. Current law, the way it is right now, the end of course test, you can't change the way the student just gets a score. What happens in the eighth grade when the educator sits down with a student and his or her family and you start assessing where that student is headed? So the student will take the eighth grade explore test and based on how he or she does, they would have that discussion and look at those test results. But it also starts the dialogue between middle school and high school, looking at student Kelly, seeing where he's strong and where he's weak, and so that they can better help that student be successful for whatever he or she wants to do. We hear about tracking. Maybe some kids are equipped to go to university. Some may be millionaires and waiting by going the community mm -hmm. college route. Mm -hmm. Who gets to make that decision? I think you'd look at a test that young and say, okay, you're, you're geared towards this or that. Right. That is not the intent of this bill at all. Um, we would hope that the parents and the child and the school counselor would help make that decision. Mm -hmm. But the goal is not to say, well, if you score a certain score, then you must go this way. And if you score this, then you can go this way. That is not the goal or the intent at all. I saw in that bill you had to the extent funds are available we will offer or, or every student shall take the ACT store, mm -hmm. score at, or test at least. Um, is, is that saying if the money's there, you would subsidize ACT testing for kids who can't afford it? That's correct. This, the State Board of Education would flow that money down to the counties so that the counties do not have to pay for this test. The state would pay for this test if funds are available, and, and we hope that funds will be. Take all those kids, all those ACT stores, scores, who do you compare them with? Um, so the scores would be compared against other states, Not but, counties. It, but, it, but it can be okay. compared against counties so that for state reporting we know. But this, unlike what we currently do, this will not punish the child. Um, you know, there's the court case out there and there's some threats that if you ended state sub uh, standardized testing that it would be unconstitutional, it may get overturned, and now is this going to satisfy those concerns of, of I'm, some people? I'm not sure if that's going to satisfy that one judge in particularly. He has a right to, to his opinion. Of mm -hmm. course, there are many people who disagree with him, but that is not our concern. Our concern is making sure that we assess students in a fair and reasonable way and something that's really going to make them better prepared for whatever they want to do. Representative Gotham, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. A House bill could give state employees flexible work schedules for the next two years. State agencies would get the authority to allow workers to work 30-hour work weeks as an employee option. This flexibility would begin immediately if this bill becomes law. I think the only uh, drawback that might be is when you got close to retirement age, when you had to have those four highest uh, salaries. I don't think you would want to be doing it then, but I think it would help some of our younger people and it would help our state to have the extra dollars there because it would revert to the funding. State agencies would be required to opt in to the partial work week option. House Bill 30 is under consideration by the House. It would allow your wages to be garnished to satisfy civil judgments. Up to 75% of a debtor's take-home pay could be seized to pay off a debt. 
The law would target people who try to purposely hide their assets to avoid paying off something they owe. This is not wide open wage garnishment. This is another narrow exception where it's going to be permitted in what's called Chapter 75 actions. That's the North Carolina Unfair and Deceptive Trade Practices Act. This bill would become law October 1st. The House and Senate scheduled Tuesday afternoon floor sessions in the old Capitol building. This is largely a symbolic event. The House of Representatives honored the Halifax Resolve's 235th anniversary. That was a resolution the state's 4th Provincial Congress unanimously approved and in instructed North Carolina's delegates to the large Second Constitutional Congress to vote for independence from Britain. The Senate used its old Capitol session to pardon former North Carolina Governor William Holden. Holden was impeached for using the state militia to fight the Ku Klux Klan. The Senate convicted him back in 1871. This week, the Senate voted to pardon him. 48 yeas, no noes. We can't change the facts of what happened 140 years ago today, but what we can do as role models for the state of North Carolina, we can affirm certain values. And this is an important message we're sending to all of North Carolina, that regardless of what our differences are, are we all share the value of equal opportunity for all. The House holds Governor Holden's pardon in its Rules Committee. Well, we'd like to invite you to find us online and make us your friend. Go to Facebook.com slash LegWeek. If you like to watch this show online, we place it on YouTube and on our show's website, unctv.org slash legweek. You can always drop a note to us, say hello, ask a question, get some background on a bill you might see on the show by emailing us at legweek at unctv.org. And one more thing, if you're on Twitter, we're NCN Leg Week. That's our show for this week. We hope to see you next time. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.